In our last video, we kicked off the building of our own civilization from scratch by starting back in the Stone Age, making a few base tools, some basic flint-napped cutting tools, and ceramics, which left our development at around 25,000 BCE. Next, we fast forward ahead 16,000 years to roughly 9,000 BCE to get ourselves out of the Stone Age and into metals, with humanity's very first metal, copper. Copper is one of the few metals that can be found in its native form, just as a chunk of copper metal. Because of this, copper is believed to be the first metal humanity discovered and learned to craft, with evidence of its first use starting around 9000 BCE. As a relatively soft metal, it can be hammered with stones and shaped into various tools and decorative objects. Previously, I traveled to California to collect a low-grade copper ore, which required a pretty sophisticated process to actually extract the copper metal. However, the largest supply of native, ready-to-use copper is actually a lot closer to me in the Keweenaw Peninsula in Michigan. So we took a short trip out to collect some of this very initial copper and got to have a bit of an adventure at Adventure Mine. But first, for a different kind of adventure, check out today's sponsor. If you're a fan of The Walking Dead, then you've got to try out The Walking Dead No Man's Land, the official mobile game of AMC's with The Walking Dead. It's a turn-based action strategy game where you battle hordes of walkers with all your favorite heroes from the show. We want to thank The Walking Dead No Man's Land for sponsoring this video. Join Rick, Daryl, and Michonne and other iconic characters from the show as they work to build up their camps and protect the living. Do you have what it takes to stay alive? The Walking Dead No Man's Land, available on iOS and Android now. We've been playing this game and we think you should too. Later in the video, we'll tell you how you can get a special bonus by downloading the game through the link below. At Adventure Mine, met up with the owner, Matt, and one of the tour guides, Mike. But this was one of the few places that they could find copper in its native form without having to smelt it. And what it is, there was a big fissure out in the middle of which is now Lake Superior. And this pulled apart. And when it pulled apart, it allowed the, the magma to flow up freely. It was more than a volcanic eruption. It actually flooded the area 80 to 120 feet deep in molten lava. As it cools, a couple things happen. The gases float up to the top. And as it cools, the rock shifts, creating these passages ways through at some point these voids that were left by the gaseous exhaust from the lava flows that would be filled with copper and other minerals through time all the water deep in the earth was superheated by this magma superheated water will readily pick up copper and other minerals as it does so the pressure and the heat move it up towards the surface as it cools it percolates down through and through the millions if not billions of years it leaves a little bit of this copper and other elements behind slowly filling in these voids left by the gases and at this point the mountain actually sheared and came up like this long after that happened the ice age came along mile thick masses of ice here came through and this is where they actually gouged that copper out of the earth it was pushed along with the till from the glaciers the glaciers receded that's where all the float copper came from it's this float copper that is the most accessible and can be found all around the Keweenaw Peninsula in Michigan however after centuries of humans finding and collecting these chunks of native copper they are now much rarer to find. To attempt to find some, Mike actually knew an area where he's had some luck finding float copper himself. Since most of this easily accessible copper has been readily collected already, we used the help of a metal detector to help us find the more rare ones that are left. Mike, this is uh, an area you said you've been able to find float copper before? We've had limited success. It's uh, They've been doing this for many years, so we're looking for kind of the leftovers from all the people that have gone before us. But the glaciers pushed everything more or less south, and as they receded, they left that till that left some float copper in it. So we tend to look on the southern banks of things. It's our most likely place to find things. So we can head off in the woods, run down a few ridges, and never know, maybe we'll find a piece today. All right, let's give it a shot. Okay, a lot of people think it settles in the low grounds and the streams and stuff. I found mine more in this type of area right here. We got something there, but let's see what it is. 
So the numbers aren't high enough. You have to be at least 75. So it's probably an old beer can buried in there. If you get a number of 75, 80 or above and it beeps in both directions, then you're pretty sure of finding some copper. The other thing I tend to do is try to get over by trees and off the path a little, thinking that over the years, many people have metal detected here. So now you're kind of looking for the chromes, which means the less obvious places. How long of sessions usually do this for? Uh, my buddy and I go out every Thursday and we'll go for probably about three hours. How often do you find something? We usually find something. Let's see if we're getting anything. Yeah, 50s and 60s, so it's just junk. What number are you getting? 92. 92, that's, let me brush the brush away, see if we're still hearing something. Are you still getting 90s? Yeah. I'd say you got a good chance. That's color you're looking for right there. Is that it? It's gotta be. Yep, distinctive green, the oxidization. So that's float copper? That's float copper. After a few hours of searching, we lucked out and found some copper. To have a few more options to work with, I also purchased a few more chunks of float copper others had found in the area. Next, we started searching for some of the deeper buried copper at some of the prehistoric mining sites. These are prehistoric, they've been since mined historically, but there is a pit which is, I think best place to see it, up here on top of that bluff that's, it's gonna be as much untouched prehistoric as you're gonna find anywhere. Hey, there's a, there's a lot of different opinions, but it looks like prehistoric mining about 4,500 years ago to roughly 8,500 years ago. Primitive mining was done a couple of different ways. Some was top down on these pits. Many of them were in pits like this. The copper, after the big upheaval, were literally sticking out of the ground. They'd been buried by millions, if not billions of years of debris, but they still found these spots and where the fissures actually came out of the mountains is where they went down in, sometimes up to 20 feet deep as they followed the fissure down into the rock. They were rather limited to how far they could go because of the technology of the day. Many people think they built big fires and then they would throw water to rapidly cool the basalt that would fracture it, make it easier to break off. They could get in there with their stone tools and things and peen off pieces. Many times they couldn't extricate the whole masses of copper. They had to settle for just basically breaking off the pieces that they could harvest. They'd use those for tools, jewelry, other things. If you find copper, what you're looking for is crest toothpaste, if that helps you any. Yeah, yeah there's copper right there, you got it. Yeah. See, it's all in this calcite seam and it yeah. wraps over here too, so. I... Next, we went down into the main mine to explore some of the more modern extractions of copper. The Adventure Mine was mined from 1850 to about 1920. Uh, by the way, the Adventure is the original name. There actually was a town site called Adventure in the 1840s. Uh, when the company came, they took the Adventure name. It is still the largest known reserve of copper any place in the whole world. You want to lead? No. Okay. Almost all of our early miners were Cornish. Uh, times were tough in England. They were hard rock miners there, some of it copper, a lot of it tin, but they understood the technique for drilling and blasting in this this environment. This was a fracture zone or a crack. You got the green epidote, white is quartz and calcite. You got the copper, you have silver, and that came in filled in all these places with these minerals over a long period of time. Ready? Yep. If we look at a drill hole here, we actually hit a piece of copper. You know, having all this copper sounds great, but actually the, the big chunks of copper are really hard to mine. When they mined this historically in like the 1800s, very labor intensive, hand drills and, and sledgehammers. Yeah, the opening you're looking at up there is about five or six feet by almost 12 feet. It's 250 feet up. Because of the, the stope you're looking up, it makes it look much, much closer, but it's a very long ways. That's actually the top of the mountain where the modern era mine intersected with an old prehistoric pit. And actually some of the rubble from the prehistoric pit then fell into the modern, modern era mine. I actually found a prehistoric copper knife blade up there rummaging around up there. Had the knife dated at roughly seven to 8,000 years old. The prehistorics also make tools and other things out of the float copper that was relatively readily available. So they, they harvested a lot of that. The other thing that they sometimes would find, there'd be rocks with real thin fissure copper in between it. And what it is is a crack so small where the copper filled it in, if you break away part of the rock, the copper that comes out is already a sheet of copper, which makes it relatively easy to make jewelry or implements out of it. So if you get real adventurous, we'd take you down. Level two is the only place I know right and find you some of that today. Yeah, it's pretty easy even one-handed, but you be the judge. 
there's 13 levels of the mine. Uh, they're about 100 feet per level. Uh, we have access to the first level, which is about uh, about a mile from one end to the other. I guess it's probably about seven to eight miles of tunnels in the entire complex here. But unfortunately, those bottom 11 levels are underwater. Now, as we're going lower, you can't get too much access yet, but everything we're seeing is nobody's seen that for the past 110 years. So it's basically left as it was. And you walk down there, you'd, you'd find something like pickaxes or, or hammers leaning against timbers, just like you can tell nobody's touched that. Somebody, some miner set that down yeah. and then they closed the mine. He never came back. And that's been sitting leaning against that timber for the past 110 years. Everything like a time capsule of, mm -hmm. of how the miners walked away when they stopped working one day. This is what they call a, a native hatchet. It just exists in the mine. You just dig it out. It's ready to use. But just so you know, this isn't safe here. Just see if we have any luck breaking rock loose around it. But there's a little piece. I'm hoping there's a big mass of it in there. We well, can see how the prehistorics could have exploited thin fissure copper like this and got enough out to work. Copper, when it oxidizes, turns green, like the Statue of Liberty. But then unlike ferrous metals, where it keeps cutting into it, it forms this kind of skin over it, and it will never erode after that. That's why we can find thousands of year old tools perfectly preserved because the copper oxidization creates a protective layer over it. I was hitting some good soft stuff up in here. We might start working on that piece. You get a decent chunk out of there by the time you're done. There you go, that's not a bad chunk. Now with a few pieces of copper I can work with, I can take them back and start cold working them. But first, another quick message from our sponsor. Just like Andy needs to scavenge for everything he needs to make tools, you can try your hand at scavenging for supplies, weapons, and survivors in the official mobile game for AMC's Walking Dead. The Walking Dead No Man's Land has tons of playable content from scenes right out of the show that lets you relive the highlights of season eight and nine with throwback moments from earlier seasons of the TV show as well. You'll work to build your crew and acquire more supplies and cool weaponry on your scavenging missions. Because it's a turn-based game, you can play it at your pace and plan your moves. Strategy is always the best way to cull a horde of walkers. Help out our channel by downloading the game through the link below today. If you use our link, you'll automatically get this legendary bayonet musket, which is great for killing walkers. Thanks for watching, now back to the video. Back home with the copper, now it's time to start shaping these chunks into some usable tools. Copper. <laughs> Rock. Working the copper causes it to harden as you go until it reaches the point of starting to crack and break. To prevent this, you need to heat it up and release the stress in a process called annealing. Then you can continue to cold work it more. And then you keep repeating until it's formed its desired shape. Once I have a rough blade shape, I can then be sharpened by rubbing it on some coarse stones and then working my way to finer and finer grain stones. As I start to near completion, I actually want to make sure the copper is under stress still and hasn't been annealed, as that will leave it with a much harder edge. This is called work hardening. Now I just need to attach it to a handle. Kind of aiming for an OC style axe, even though his was actually cast copper. I'm gonna try and get something close to what he used for a handle, which is kind of a, a stick with a 90 degree end to it. This stick here, it's got a 90 degree branch right there. It might work well. Let's see if I can cut this with the axe head. I can already tell copper is a lot easier than stone. <clears throat> Tough tree. Alright, and I'm bleeding. Cool. <laughs> Alright, here's a stick. Just gotta get this mounted in there. See if we can find ones that look a little bit better as an alternative.
All right, so I got a couple options. So far, first impressions, the copper works pretty good cutting, but a handle would make a big difference. I feel like I can't get enough force, and when I give it any force, it really hurts your hand. So a handle is gonna be very nice. All right, so here's the hemp we accidentally stumbled upon last time. It, uh, I'm assuming it's hemp. Hemp was growing here at, during World War II in Minnesota, and most wild varieties you find today are just leftover hemp. And hemp's a pretty sturdy plant. Actual marijuana that you would smoke is not too sturdy. This could be marijuana. This could be like a private garden. Somebody's been trying to grow here on public land. Hopefully not, because I'm about to cut some of it. Either way, the stock should make some decent fibers for making rope. Just de-leaf them so they look less suspicious. <laughs> to make rope out of hemp, I first soak the stalks in water, then remove the fibrous exterior from its hard inner core. Then lay out the fibers and turn them into a rope by twisting them together to form two strands, combining to form a basic rope. To help hold everything in place, I used some pine sap I collected earlier to help glue it together onto the hemp rope. After making the axe, I then made an adze with the blade rotated 90 degrees, another useful tool for shaping wood. All right, so now I've officially left the Stone Age. I have an ax and an adze, both made from a copper. And already I can tell the copper has made a pretty big difference in my ability to cut things versus a flint. It has uh, a lot more resilience, so I can hit it a lot harder and get much deeper cuts. However, I have noticed that it dulls very easily and just cutting the wood to make the handle, I had to resharpen it. And at this point, it's probably about due for a new sharpening. It's nowhere near modern steel. It's definitely an improvement, but it's not great. And it's easy to tell why once bronze was figured out, they quickly replaced copper. When you look at some of the historical artifacts that are found from this era, it's very impressive. It's obviously people who have learned a skill that I am just starting at. Kind of understandable minds not quite as good. These new tools should hopefully make building anything else in the future a lot easier. All right, so now that I have some metal tools, next up I can try and actually make some more advanced woodworking projects. The next major project we're gonna be pursuing is one of the earliest forms of transportation, dugout canoe. The first step of that is going to be to cut down a tree. So we're gonna put copper to the test against flint, see which one can cut down a tree quicker. We're also gonna do a, another form made by just grinding a stone into a sharpened edge. Potentially it might be better than the copper. Copper's pretty soft, it's a pretty small blade and the ground stone is actually pretty effective. So be sure to subscribe, hit the notification bell so you don't miss out on that. All right, then in terms of hours of labor to actually make them, seven hours and 15 minutes to make this guy, paying someone minimum wage, it's about $60, and six hours and 45 minutes to make this one, and this is about 55. Check out our Instagram for a sneak peek at our upcoming videos. Join the discussion on our Discord. And once again, thank you to all of our supporters on Patreon. Without you, we aren't able to make really cool trips like this out to Michigan and other places. Any amount really helps, but for $15 or more, get your name on the board. And for $75 or more, ingots we collected at the mine itself. See a little piece of Adventure Mine with you. Thanks again for your support. Thanks again for watching. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to subscribe and check out other content we have covering a wide variety of topics. Also, if you've enjoyed these series, consider supporting us on Patreon. We are largely a fan-funded channel and depend on the support of our viewers in order to keep our series going. Thanks for watching.